If you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter number one. We're in this series that I'm calling Living in Babylon. We'll be mostly spending our time in the book of Daniel. We'll cover the first chapter today. We don't really know much about Daniel's life uh, before the, the time of Daniel 1.1, before the time that Babylon came in to besiege um, Jerusalem and Israel. Uh, we don't know anything about his family. We don't know about his dad or his mom or his, how many brothers and sisters that he had. We don't know really anything about any of those things. His past is a mystery. Did they live close to Jerusalem? Did he get a chance to go to synagogue school? Uh, did he, did he, uh, what, what trade was the family doing? We don't know really any of those things whatsoever. Did he have access to Scripture at all? Uh, but what we can summarize is this. When Daniel chapter 1 happened, he was probably, y'all listening, in the 5th or 6th grade. Um, he had a strong understanding of Jehovah God, Yahweh. Uh, his family had done an extremely good job of uh, telling him the things of God. But Daniel's life was lived among two opposing forces. All of his life, he lived in turmoil, everywhere it was. Threats, opposition, difficulties, hardships. Every day of his life that he grew up, he lived with this strong overtone, overtone upon him. These two opposing forces were very evidently seen in his life and in society. Good versus evil. Moral versus, for, uh, versus the immoral. Selfish versus the generous. Having a purpose or living a life that Solomon called vanity. With understanding and a reverence for God and His Word, the God who has made us in His image, that was the opportunities that Daniel had every day to choose between those two opposing forces that were there. Because you see, in Daniel's life, we don't know when Babylon first came. We don't have any record of any um, major battle until the besiege of Jerusalem. They came and that, that uh, invasion began in 606 B.C. Jerusalem was captured in 597 B.C. And in 587, the temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was burned. That's what we know. And this fifth or sixth grader grew up with that political, that, that great dark cloud hanging over every day. Not being able to live with the things that we take for granted, the freedoms that we have every day. To choose what we want to do, to go where we want to go, to work or school or any of those things, to live in the land of what we call the free. And yet, we still live in a land of opposing forces. If you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you once again if you would stand up with me for a few seconds in honor of God's Word and let us read part of the first chapter. And we pray that God will add His blessings to the reading of His Word. Daniel 1 verse 1 says this, In the third year of the reign of Jeho Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants, some of the nobles, young men, in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the, the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might, they might serve before the king. 
Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Dan Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, many of us know this book of Daniel so very well. We love this book. We are thankful that it was written, that it is your word. But Lord, not just your word, it's your word for us. And Father, in your provision, in your providential hand, there were some things that Israel did that did not honor you, and it cost them their freedoms. Their freedoms in the world, but not their freedoms before you. May we hear that. And Lord, as we learn from what they had to go through, and as we see the world that we're living in today, I pray, Lord, that we would follow the example of Daniel and his three friends, and how they loved you, and how, as the Scripture says, they purposed in their heart to not defile themselves. I pray, Lord, that we would seek that today, choose that today. And Lord, by your power, by your will, by your strength, by your redeeming factor, that you would do that work in us today. For your glory, but most definitely for our benefit. Speak plainly, speak clearly, speak to our hearts, speak in growth, speak in freedom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. Babylon's quest was apparent to everyone. They wanted to come and conquer. They wanted to assimilate the people of Israel into the ways of Babylon. They not only wanted to conquer the people, listen to me, they wanted to conquer their will. For them to live, for them to succeed, for them to not have constant battle, they had to defeat not only the armies of Israel, they had to besiege not just the walls of Jerusalem, but they had to besiege the walls in their hearts of the people that were there. They had to come in and change them. They took everything that was theirs, Israel's, and made it their own. Plunder of the riches, of the supplies, yes, of the men, but most importantly, of their will. To bend their will to their own will. And how did they do that? First, two major things. Number one, they needed to destroy their religion. Look what it says in verse number two. It says that, that, that the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands, with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. He brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. And then he did all those other things. The first thing that he wanted to do was defeat the religion. Israel was what is known as a theocracy. In America, we have a republic. We, we talk about democracy, the, the, the will of the people, the vote of the people. And we put people into office. And by the way, it's not going to be very long until we have a, a vote that's coming up. I think it's going to be an important vote. And I think if you understand the freedoms that you have in your country, you need to voice your vote. Don't just say it doesn't matter. Between you and God, you have something that you need to do every day. And as part of this great republic that we live in, you need to express that. But they didn't have a republic. They had a theocracy. That meant God was its head. And it had been that way. When God 
led his people, he began always talking directly to the people. He led with a whisper. He led as he moved in their hearts and in their lives. And then he would have prophets that would come and, and proclaim, thus saith the Lord. But they wanted more than that. They didn't like it only that God spoke to hearts. They wanted someone else to instruct it. I mean, God could talk to Abraham and lead him actually out of the land of Mesopotamia where the uh, Babylon became to bring him into the Holy Land. He could talk to, to Moses in a burning bush, but they wanted something more direct than that. And they wanted a government. They saw all the others around them. They said, we want a king. So they chose a king. Saul, how'd that work out for him? Not too well. But then God brought them a king by the name of David, and his qualification was he was a man after God's own heart. And David wanted to, David knew and understand that for them to be successful, they needed to be a theocracy. Everything would flow from God. So everything in society pointed to God. Economically, their economic system, their political system, their religious system, everything was with God at the head. They had a theocracy there. And the temple was the centerpiece of that. God didn't need that. I mean, God has heaven, amen? That is his home. And in and, and Psalms 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. God is very capable of speaking to hearts. He was when he spoke to my heart. God is very capable of, of, of dealing directly with us. By the way, the way that you get to heaven is God talking to your heart. And you're joining the heart of God and becoming a follower of Christ. And giving your heart and life to Christ. Letting Him be your King. Letting Him be your Lord. It's a one-on-one -on -one decision. Nobody else can make it for you. Amen? But the temple... I mean, they went from God speaking to hearts to, I mean, Moses had the tabernacle, the tent that would get up and move. And, and David said, I want to build you a, a house. God said, I don't really need that, but you do what you want to do. By the way, David, I'm not going to let you do that because you've shed blood. You're a man of war. He let Solomon build it. And it was amazing. People would come from all over the world to see the temple. As a matter of fact, it was... Um, so important, about a 150, 180 years before that, uh, when King Hezekiah, y'all remember King Hezekiah? He was a good king. God said he was going to die. God sent Isaiah to him and said, said, told Isaiah, said, uh, tell, the, tell the king he's going to die. And I, Hezekiah cried out to God and said, I, I don't want to die. I've been faithful to you. And God told Isaiah, said, well, all right, go back. And he, he, Isaiah went back to him and said, God's going to give you 15 more years. By the way, I don't want that. Could you imagine every birthday you have? Well, that's one less year. Well, I'm one, I'm one year closer. And that last year, boy, he was counting the days, wasn't he? I don't think I want that. I'll tell you one, one of the other reasons why Hezekiah began to coast. As a matter of fact, there was an envoy that came from Babylon that came to see King Hezekiah to, to bring him a gift because he had gotten better from his sickness. And Hezekiah was showing him around the temple and showing him how magnificent it was. And, and, and the envoy from Babylon was so amazed by it. And then Hezekiah showed him into the treasury of all the, the gold and all the articles that had been given to God but was, but was stored in the temple. And they said, hmm and went back and told their leaders. And they never forgot it. And yes, the day of doom was written that day, though it didn't come for 150 years. There are things that happened in the past that are affecting us today. We're living, our parents and our grandparents, Come on. And our great-grandparents, we're living what, what, what they have led down to us, and we are leaving a footprint that our children 
and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren will follow in. Why was it important that they destroy the religion? Well, who are you going to bow to? Who is your allegiance to? If they could destroy their God, then who are you going to bow to? Babylon wanted them to feel that their God was small, irrelevant, weak, and defeated. One of Satan's most fertile battlegrounds, and I pray that in the next five minutes you will listen to the Spirit as He speaks to your heart. One of Satan's most fertile battlegrounds is our thought life. The battle is won or lost in the thoughts that you either keep or dismiss. Satan would rather us think wrong than do wrong. Now your parents may not have taught you that. You might have heard a lot of preaching that says you got to do right, do right, do right, do right. The thing is, is that sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Satan would rather you think wrong than do wrong. Because if you do wrong, that is a single act and you may repeat it, you may not repeat it. But if you think wrong, it's going to happen. It's going to invade your life. It's going to lead your life. So what Satan does, he wants to attack you and what you believe. Because as you believe, that's how you're going to live. As you believe, that's what your lifestyle is going to be. So Satan plants seeds of lies all throughout our life and in society. And it takes time for those seeds to take root. But once those seeds of lies take root in our life, it's almost impossible for them to be uprooted. So we live what we believe, either a lie or the truth. Either we believe or unbelieve, either wisdom from God or vanity. Either that which lasts throughout all of eternity or that which is gone after a day. That which is honoring or that which is shameful. That's why 2 Corinthians 10 says that we need to take every thought captive. Church, I'm going to be very transparent with you. The things that the major things that I battle in my life, I have battled since I was a young child. I had a godly parents, godly father, a brilliant man, a success in life. I have two older brothers and an older sister. I was the tag along. Mom was tired. Dad was off conquering the world. And Satan knew how to come in and put these thoughts into your head to make you seem small, to make you seem insignificant. And I've battled those things my whole life. Matter of fact, of the two things that I've battled my whole life, battled my whole life, one began before I can even remember, and one began when I was a teenager. And once those seeds take root, though in your mind you you know those things to be, you, you think those things to be wrong, yet you try to do everything that you can to make them right. I don't know all your stories, but I can tell you with a truth, I can tell you that we all fall into this same thing. Every human being from Eve down has found that Satan likes to throw those seeds of doubt into your life. Satan wants to attack your thought life. That's the battlefield. Today, Satan wants Christians to feel outdated, overwhelmed, old-fashioned, pushy, but yet isolated, small, against the great wisdom and the the tsunami of this new modernism that the world is bringing in. He wants them to doubt. He wants them to fight among each other. He wants them to compromise. He wants them to be distracted. He wants them to forget God's faithfulness 
but to to remember the perceived failures in their life and their losses. That's why we're not supposed to talk about our faith. That's why in the world today, they say you can talk about anything else, just don't mention the name of Jesus. Keep it to yourself. We don't want it in the schools. We don't want it at work. They will fire you over stuff. We're a right-to-work state. They can fire you for any reason whatsoever. You need to keep your Christianity to yourself. You're very grateful for what God's done for you. But you see other people, but you don't want, you don't share Christ with them because you think that that might be wrong. You think that they, they will turn against you. We, you think that they don't want to listen. All those things of, of pushing down your Christianity to where they can, are y'all listening? They wanted our Christianity to be the size of this room. As long as they can keep us confided in this room, Satan's happy. And to an extent, he'll work to get us to fight against each other over things that are trivial and have no eternal significance. He wants us small. And by the way, it really doesn't matter the size of the room. Whether it's 100 people or 1,000 people or 10,000 people, he wants them confined to the room. He wants them locked up into his way of thinking. Babylon knew this, and this was their goal. Number two, he wanted to steal a generation. Look what it says in verse 3. Then the king instructed Ashpence, the, the, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel, some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. You know what he said? If I can steal this generation... I've got them for three. I'm going to say that again. If I can steal this generation, that means I've got three generations. As a matter of fact, if I steal this generation, I'll get more of the next generation. And I'll get more of the next generation. Did y'all hear that? This is a fight for the souls Churches are so much today talking about the future and what their future holds. But yet they, they live their, their Christianity in a rearview mirror, looking to the past. They, 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 they want to celebrate when they were a youth. And I appreciate that. But just, just come and understand, he's not after you if you've been around 70 years, but he wants your grandchildren. As a matter of fact, I don't know too many grandparents in this room that would not take a bullet for their grandchildren. You would say, I'll freely go without so that they can have. And yet, that's not the choice Satan's trying to get you to make. What is happening now is a neglect. What Nebuchadnezzar wanted to do was to get the minds of the youth to assimilate them, their language, Make it a different language. What they studied, the literature, instead of studying the scriptures of God, study the literature of the world, the ways of the world, the wisdom of the world. We'll educate them in the, in, in the modern society. How many people today say, oh, the most important thing is an education. The most important thing is that our kids have all these activities. The most important thing is we do them with all these things. And by the way, I'm not too sure that this generation today is not the busiest generation we ever had. I used to take sticks and make forts. I mean, if I laid a log, that was a wall. And we would play with sticks and I'd have a ball and I'd throw it up against the wall and catch it. We didn't have all these things. Yes, I played sports. Now they do sports year-round, travel ball, by the way, on Wednesdays and Sundays. Everything is about taking up everything that they can in that generation and making it theirs. 
changing their names. You think that was significant? Daniel's name meant the Lord is my judge. Nebuchadnezzar changed his name because names them have meaning to them. Belshazzar is what they gave him, which means Lord of the straightened treasure. I'll give you a different treasure. I'll give you something that will make you understand that this is what you should value. Didn't work. Hananiah gave him, Hananiah means God has favored. Amen? God has favor, but they gave him the name Shadrach, which means the great scribe. Oh, we're going to make you a great scribe. You're going to be a leader. Others will follow you. You're going to be the, 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 the next leader of the next generation. Mishael means who is what God is. Nobody. God is God alone. But they changed his name to Meshach. Simply the guest of a king. You think that you're, you're, there's no God like you're a God? Listen, I'm going to let you live with me. You're the guest of a great king, Nebuchadnezzar. That's what his name became to mean. Azariah meant Jehovah has helped. This one gets me. They gave him the name Abednego. Abed servant, Nego, was the name of their God. You're now a servant of our God. You used to have your identity as Jehovah, as the God who helps. Now you're just a servant of another God. Look what he says in verse 5. The king apportioned for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. I'll give you the best of what we have. I, I, I'm going to change your food. I'm going to change your custom. I'm going to change your clothing. I'm going to change your values. I'm going to change your priorities because Nebuchadnezzar was treating them very good, but he wanted them to make them his own. The world will try to make you look foolish for trusting God. But what we need to do is believe and trust in the Holy God. Believe. Believe. We need to believe. We need to believe. When I was 10 years old, and I moved from sin, and I gave my heart and life to Christ, it was because I believed. I said, I give you my heart, I give you my life. And now my life is living in believing in God. Trusting in God. Church, I got a word for you. We may live in a republic, but we still have a theocracy. He is God over my economics. He's God over my society. He's God over my understanding. He's God over my learning. He's God over my behavior. He's God over my political system. He's God over all. In that, I believe. Look in verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, now God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. By the way, could you imagine a fifth or sixth grader being taken away from his home, being taken away from his family, and, and taken into a foreign land? Probably you would think kicking and screaming. But there was something about this young man, Daniel. He, he believed in God. He knew the ways of God. He knew that God did not create us to be angry and mean at each other. And we honor God by how we live among each other. There's never a good reason to do wrong. No one has the right to be rude. You may feel righteous in your, in your anger. You may feel like you have the right to, to speak your mind. Not if you have a holy God that's in you and guiding you. 
We spend every day on this earth as if we were walking in the presence of the Holy God, Jehovah, Yahweh, our friend, Jesus, our Savior and provider. And Daniel knew that and lived his life as such. So though he was a slave child in a foreign land, he still lived his Christianity every day. Verse 10, chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For, for, for why? <clears throat> hmm. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants. Do it for 10 days. Let them give to us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examples before you. Let who we are be seen before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies and as you see fit, so deal with your servants. You know what he was saying? I love this. Y'all ready? He was doing to them what they were trying to do to him. They were trying to assimilate him into their thinking. And Daniel says, I tell you what, let's do a test. Let us do the things that we know are right. And in 10 days, let's see what happens. You want to give us your best? Just give us vegetables and we'll see what God does. We trust God. We believe and he's able to take care of us. Well, the eunuch consented with them in verse 14. He consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portions of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they uh, were to drink and gave them vegetables. You may have heard the, the Daniel diet. Well, this is what it is. Verse 17. As for these four young men, God gave them. Hold on. Who gave them? The ways of the world? The teachings of the world? assimilated to the wisdom of, of Babylon? No, 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 no. God in that place, God was there for them. God is with you where you are. God is with your children and your grandchildren. Do you hear me? God gave them knowledge and skill and all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days when the king had said that he should... Uh, they should be brought in. The chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, verse 19, and among them all, uh, none was found. None was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king exam examined them, he found them ten times better than all the, the magi. Y'all remember Jesus and his birth and the ones coming from the, from the east, the Magi? From the, all the magicians and the astrologers who were in all the, his realm. Come on now. Ten times better. Can y'all say that? Ten times better. Come on, let's do it one more time. Ten times better. What a God we serve. And yet there's so many people today that are saying, we've got to give them the best of the world. If we only take them to church and we only teach them those little stories of, of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if we, if we just, we're, we're limiting our children. Come on, let's say it with me again. Ten times better. We're either going to be conformers or transformers. We're either going to be conformed or we're going to be transformed. And if we are conformers, listen to me, we're going to look like the world, we're going to talk like the world, we're going to act like the world, and we'll have the influence of the world. But if we can be transformed by God, we can transform them. We'll do a flip job. Revival will come. And God will pour His blessings upon His people. And His people will live before the world. 
Isn't this what Paul told the Romans in chapter 12? The Christians in the capital of the world at that time, Rome, he said to them, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Oh, that we would understand that if God transforms us and we believe and live for Him, He can transform others. And we can do a flip job. Instead of Satan stealing a generation, we can take back a generation. And not only will it build that generation, it'll build the next generation and the next generation and the next. After World War II, we had peace in America. The home was strong. The 50s, y'all remember? I don't remember the 50s. I came here in the 60s. But I do remember some of the 50s, 60s. Do y'all remember the 60s? It didn't look like the 50s, did they? People mad at the world. Mad about society. And they wanted the world to be fit to their image rather than following the image of God. Now listen, churches in our area, churches in the South, there were so many buildings built in the 50s. But then the 60s came, and there was a crowd, and there was a movement of God, but we've seen a decrease ever since then. A slow decrease. The 70s were, well, we couldn't trust the politicians anymore. You think inflation's bad now, 8.5%? How would you like to have 19% again? Oh, we had a little... A little turning around in the 80s, but that was just Satan throwing his seed in other places. In the 90s, in the 2000s, in 2010, in 2022, we've lost a generation, and we've lost their children, and we've lost their grandchildren. But yet it begins here. It begins here. It begins what God does in our heart. It begins what we value in these pews. It begins if we're going to get outside of these walls and live our Christianity out there or if we're just going to continue to live our Christianity in here. I say this in closing, my last phrase. Every great movement of revival in the history of the church has begun with young people. Chew on that. They don't have the wisdom of the older people. That is true. But they have passion to believe. If we don't fight for the next generation, I proclaim this with all my heart, if we don't fight for the next generation, we're going to lose three. Three.